Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Valerie Williams. I will be your MC slash hostess this evening. Welcome to the Earl Warner Trust Lifetime Achievement Awards Ceremony. We're honoring another one of our Caribbean theater greats, Mr. Ken Corsby, as you know. We're honoring him for his lifetime of outstanding contribution to Caribbean theater. So, friends of drama, friends of storytelling, friends of theater, welcome. I want to especially welcome our members of the press. I want to acknowledge our fellow trustees here. A special welcome to our chair trustee, Mr. David Neelands, and special welcome to Karen Ford Warner, who's in from Jamaica for this special occasion. Also want to acknowledge um, two of our former, mem uh, former awardees who are here, Dr. Cynthia Wilson and Mr. Claremont Tate, who are sitting in the front row. Also Caribbean theater greats in their own right. I'd like to also acknowledge the presence of His Excellency, Mr. Francisco Fernandez Peña, who's the ambassador Republic from the Republic of Cuba. Welcome, sir. Also, Ms. Monique Jackman, who is the officer in charge from the Consulate General in Guyana. Welcome, Ms. Monique Jackman. This evening is going to be fun, I promise. It's not going to take your usual awards ceremony format. We are going to welcome someone else who is going to do that. I want to introduce someone who is an actor, poet, writer, artist, acting coach, teacher, and a little bit of a poet and philosopher in his own right. I want to welcome Nala. Evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, unfortunately, Nala couldn't be here tonight. So he asked me to fill in for him. Ladies and gentlemen, I am the $2 philosopher. And um, the reason that I felt I wanted to do this tonight is that I, those of you that know me know that I enjoy complaining and I like to complain about continuity. And here was a chance for me to participate in the continuity that I often long for. The man that we're honoring tonight is partly responsible for my existence, um, which may not be anything to be proud of, <laughs> um, but he, He's done a lot of work on stage, he's done a lot of work in, in the media, and as a young man, well, younger than a young man, as a young boy, I remember being very excited in the evenings when a program called Caribbean Eye was on. That, that excited my imagination because here were people that shared my experience and they were, they were talking about what it was to be in the Caribbean and, and you know, exploring that experience. And it, it made a tremendous impact on me. That was one of quite a few things that made me decide that this very exciting path would be the one that I take. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pride and happiness that I introduce Mr. Ken Corsby. <laughs> okay, I think maybe we should bring Nala back at this point. So Ken, thanks for, thanks for coming out and being part thanks. of us. Well, <laughs> I have to thank everybody. Uh, <laughs> later on, I gotta, I'm going to thank 65 people in 60 seconds. 65 people in 60 seconds? I said, oh, waste time, Ken. Okay, <laughs> I look forward to that. Um, as I was, I was saying to the audience, as I introduced you, that you, you had a tremendous impact on me and I'm sure a lot of actors in my generation. I've heard you referred to as one of the fathers of Caribbean. More like grandfathers. <laughs> <laughs> one of the fathers of yeah, okay. Caribbean theater and, and storytelling. Now, I'm aware that we don't often think of ourselves in these terms. 
-hmm. But, I mean, there was a lot going on in the Caribbean, like when you embarked on, on He Won, and, you know, there was a lot of thinking about the type of theater that should be happening and that kind of thing. So you, you do see how, how people would see yeah. you in that way, how they would see you as the one of the fathers of Caribbean. I, I came up, Nala, at the right time, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the only time it could have happened. 1960s was independence was passing all over. And uh, what happened in, in the theater, anyhow, the UWI extramural department mm -hmm. published a whole series of Caribbean plays. One act, two acts, long plays, masses of them, some 20 or 30 of them. Wow. And throughout the Caribbean, Theater groups of all sorts were p playing Caribbean theater. Okay. Right? So I came at that time. I came just after that. When, um, so that, and then there was independence. Whole different thing. Mm. Remember, I came, up in, I came up as a teenager in my 20s in the theater in colonial times. I did right. a lot of great American, great European, great English plays, whether it's Shakespeare, whether it's uh, Mother Courage and those kind of plays. So I was acquainted with all that. At the same time, during the 60s and late 50s, came these local plays. Okay. And I got involved in that. So I was working now on two planes. Right? Oh. So at that time, perfect. Mm. And at that time, I then got this scholarship to go to England to do drama. So I came back as the only trained dramatist in the place. <laughs> so yes, the 60s was very exciting. And that led in naturally, to the 70s, which another change occurred. Mm -hmm. Well, the 70s would have been um, Carrie Fest. Carrie Fest in 72. Okay. Was this, was this around the time that you yeah. would have started doing He Won? Yeah, I tell you. Yes, yes. Mm. 72 came, a lot of excitement all over the Caribbean. And I was watching, I brought over, I was sort of, assigned to be the director or the manager of the Theatre Guild. It was a small theatre in Guyana. It was very mm -hmm. active. The Theatre in Guyana, much of it. Um, and we brought over a Guyanese actor named Slade Hopkinson from Trinidad yes. to do a one-man show. We'd never seen a one-man show before. He did three sections. He did Shakespeare, he did his own poetry, and he did Caribbean works, whether it's Sam Selvan and a poet sort of stuff. I listened to the audience from one to ten. Shakespeare, mm, three and a half, four. <laughs> His own works, mm, four, four and a half. The Shakespeare is nine, ten. The, the I mean, sorry, the Caribbean, Caribbean work, right. And a light went off. I could dispense with costume, <laughs> makeup, directors, <laughs> lighting technicians. <laughs> eh, eh, I don't have to rehearse for three months, somebody else. That's it. <laughs> And that's how the Hewan was born. Okay. I was lazy. I didn't want to be involved in the difficulty <laughs> of theatre. <laughs> and I, what I did, I got a lot of Caribbean poetry from various books. I did library and various things. And I chose poets, poems that were performable. Right. Or all type of work. And I sat in front of a podium, script, three-quarter read, quarter acted out. Caribbean poetry. It probably was the first time people were hearing Caribbean poetry instead of hearing their own poetry, at least performed. Right, right, right. So even when we moved in the Caribbean, people were surprised to hear Caribbean poetry. And we were legitimizing the languages too, of, and right, the accents. Of the Caribbean, yeah. right. Again, I said, all at the right time. So were you consciously aware that you would have been pioneering at this point, or is this something that, you no, know how it goes often? Uh, been, well, having moved around and seen the responses, we, hey, we were surprised too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go to Jamaica, hard Jamaica, that had a lot of good theater. You go into Little, little Caribbean, no, not Little Caribbean, Little Theater was called. Mm -hmm. People were paying money, but standing outside looking through the window. Wow. And, and staying throughout the whole show. Jamaicans, hard theater people, writing about this, them too. We were surprised, yes. Okay. At the same time, we were having a heck of a good time. <laughs> I would imagine. But how it worked is that I was the technical theater man. I knew what lighting and where to stand. And Mark Matthews, my other person at them too, was the animal. When he was on stage, everybody was watching him, not me. I might be performing there. 
He's sitting there, and people are watching him. <laughs> so that's how it went. It, it was a lot of energy happening at the right time. Okay. And you kind of tapped into that Caribbean yes. ness. Yes. Well, you have often referred to yourself as a Caribbean man. Mm-hmm. And um, I have to say that most of us in the Caribbean do that. I mean, I call myself a Caribbean man all the time. But I gather for you this has a special resonance. So much so that so I'm sure some of the people in the audience will get this, but I was going to ask you initially. You're asking me. To, All right. Yeah. Let me go in another one before I even get to the Caribbean. Mm. My grandmother, on my father's side, is a Bayesian, was a Bayesian. My ex wife, born in Barbados. <laughs> I have a grandson in Barbados, a daughter who's a Bayesian, married to a Bayesian. So, I mean, that, and my eldest son just got Bayesian citizenship. So, yeah, so was, okay. So, yes, I was um, part of the, that was the beginning of the roots. Oh, but let me go right back. I did just 17, and I wouldn't tell you what year that was. <laughs> I can leave all it, I can do your calculations. I was 17 years old. I came over here to cable and wireless to learn out Morse code. You know what Morse code is? <laughs> <laughs> Huh? <laughs> I could do the whole alphabet in Morse if you want. I mean, you can do it. We learned Morse code and typing for cable and wireless. And I went back to Guyana. So I stayed here nine months. Ah, so okay. if you add all that other thing, I was here for nine months mm. as a 17 year old. That's impressionable time. God, I could go in the sea and come out clean. <laughs> <laughs> Guyanese, don't forget all your West Indian used to call the Guyanese mudheads. <laughs> because we go to the seawall and jump in the ocean. <laughs> and when you're going home, you, the mud dry on you and thing. And crack. <laughs> yes, of surprise. I think at that impressionable time, mm. inside my skull, said, I got this Caribbean is fantastic. And specifically Barbados. Barbados. At the time, I hadn't gone anywhere else. Wow. That's terrific. So, and I think there was planted the seeds of uh, an interest, you know? In and again, um, so when 30, 40 years later, Slade Huffington comes and he does the Caribbean right. thing, aha, gorgeous. <laughs> the variety is what I found with the Caribbean works. Oh, okay. A Trinidadian, completely different works, and a Grenadian, and a Jamaican actor. And we tried to half imitate the accents or the feelings of those right, poems most right. of the time. So I, I want to take you back a little bit because as even though you would have been influenced by all of this feeling of Caribbean connection, there still had to be a seed planted before that allowed you to be receptive to this, if you see what I mean. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your background, a little bit about growing up in Guyana uh-huh. and, and the things that would have helped shape and point you in the direction. If I had to, to tell you, Nala, one item in my life of 10 years, 15 years, one section, mm-hmm. that why I'm sitting here, I would say the Tate's Yard. The Tate's Yard. Claremont out there and the Tate's family. The Tate's Yard triggered what I am now. Okay. Tate's Yard is a very straight yard. Let me, let me get this. Probably nowhere else in the world. They had this big two, three-story house. Mm-hmm. In the living room, a sim- two, two orchestras. One a symphony orchestra and a police band or something. The mother was a contralto singer. One daughter used to sing. Claremont was a violinist. First violinist in the symphony orchestra. Ah. Uh, he used to sing too. Downstairs, we had a steel band. Our own steel band. Helen, the, the dancer, the, dan- the daughter, she was a ballet dancer. She taught us ballet, Claremont, myself, and all them fellas living. You, you oh, did I, ballet, Ken? Yeah, boy. I know about <laughs> point and demi play, <laughs> fondue and thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had that, all of that. <laughs> so, uh, all those things. Then, hey, I learned, I became one of the West Indian's tough high hurdlers by learning to hurdle with one hurdle. <laughs> On a lawn, you run, you walk back, and you run again. You walk. <laughs> and it's ten and a half to run. From a book called Science of Athletics by Dr. Harold Abrams, the man from Chariots of Fire, 
English. Right. And we learned the hurdle. Clem Lawrence, one of the Tate's yard, well, a Tate, Clement's brother, became Britain's top high hurdle. We, the genesis of it was one hurdle in the Tate's lawn. Whoa, whoa. They had no basketball in Ghana. Nobody knew what it was. It started right there. Yeah. We went to see a film called Go Man Go, Harlem Globetrotters, 19, this was when I was 20, 21, 22. And we said, that's it. No more cricket for hardball to knock you in your head. <laughs> Nobody to broke your ankle with football. <laughs> Basketball, if the ball hit you, you're dead. <laughs> and that's it. We, picked, we started basketball in Guyana. No one would know anything about it. Whoa, whoa. And we started basketball. It's become now the third top sport in Guyana. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not talking. Did you ask me how the, that genus, that thing, that place, that embryo. Mm -hmm. We also did our own plays. Helen, the sister who was a ballet dancer, wrote musicals and we Whoa. performed them in, in the Queen's College big stage. Amala Vaka, uh, uh, you know, Future is Bright, M big musicals. Wow. The mother, Mrs. State, organized Gilbert and Sullivan and we as kids, teenagers, were doing the, the stage management and stuff. I don't think there could be any other place like that. Yeah, that sounds... That it was like a hive of activity yes. happening there, yeah. Yes. Okay. One, of the, one, of, the, one of the top um, artists of Ghana came out of that. Michael Jerks, receiver of the award, this award, three mm. or four years ago. He came out of that. Out of know, the out same. Of the okay. He's a Tate's, he's a cousin of the Tate's, that's a Tate's man. Ah, okay. Figure okay, that out. So, so yes, that's the... Uh, there were lots of other things, of course. My mm -hmm. mother and father were Trinidadians. So all your life you listen to Trinidad old talk. Because Trinidad is good at old talk. Boy, oh, God. Them could sweet talk. And Trinidadian talk. And uh, Guyana is a very polyglot. Everybody's in mixed up, in mixed up, mixed yes. up. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, I, I, I mix up bad, you know. I mean, I just... Take off all six boxes in this American census. <laughs> Native American, tick. White, tick. Black, tick. Asian, tick. A tick in a, let them deal with that. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, say, you could, <laughs> let me go right down to the grandchildren. My grandchildren got seven all year in mix up. You name it, we got it. <laughs> Kuli, black, Chinese, Portuguese, everything. Everything is there. Yeah. Everything is there. And so I always said, the way to solve the world's problem, you pass an international law. Nobody can marry somebody with the same ilk. <laughs> <laughs> you have to marry another ilk. After three generations, everybody would look like me. And, world solved. An, an ilkless world. <laughs> so, so I, I know. I digress, okay? No, that's, that's fine. My, my wife, when I'm doing any show, can do not digress, do not stay, stay on... Stay on topic. Yeah. Okay. All right. As you were saying. Yes, as I was saying. <laughs> you, you talk about the Tate House, mm -hmm. and you kind of alluded to your Bajan connection yeah. earlier. Dr. Tate was a Bajan, wasn't he? Dr. Tate, Clement's father, was mm. Bajan. Ah, so again, this, this connection. And when I was here in 17 years old, mm. the people, I, the family that I latched on to and was there every day almost, was the Paines, Dr. Payne, which is Claremont's father's brother, so it's Claremont's uncle. Mm. So the Paines were Claremont's first cousins. Okay. So, you know, that the taste there for first blood related to the Bayesians. I lived up in, I lived in that yard uh, at, in Country Road. I hear it. All right. If you want to know how much I'm involved, I'm a Bayesian. When I was, nobody in the world did what I did. <laughs> I did the same thing when I was here at Cable and Wireless. I played marble cricket. Oh, you know what marble cricket is? I played marble cricket with Bree St. John and Tom Adams. <laughs> Beat that. <laughs> I should get citizenship right <laughs> But you said you spent 17 years in Barbados. 17 years. Uh, oh. I left here 20 years ago. I and came yeah. here 
In 79. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 17 so, years. So there was a nine-month period and then... Then uh, came back, yes. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about that? Why, why you came back? Good what question. life in Barbados was Good like question. for you? And during the 1970s, mm -hmm. the culmination of the, uh, the actions during the 60s were began to happen. And I had already started to move around from 1973 with them too. Right. That is Mark Matthews and myself from Guyana, all over the Caribbean. Then it was joined by another, by, by Henry Mutu, another friend of ours. Then it was joined by Johnny Agar, the, the poet. And we moved, combinations of us, moved throughout the Caribbean, performing Caribbean poetry, Caribbean story, Caribbean mm -hmm. song, whatever. And that was sort of generating a lot of, I knew, began to knew people, know people, and people know me, and they, they liked what we were doing. So sometime in the 70s, an energy occurred that we, f I and others, found funding from an American agency called the Inter-American Foundation to f join, to make an organization, to create an organization, an agency called Theater Information Exchange, TIE. TIE, okay. Barbados is the natural place to come. It always is for central. It is, it, things work in Barbados, <laughs> although some Barbados don't think so. <laughs> things work well in Barbados. As well as, as well as anybody else or better at the time, the getting in and out of Barbados is very easy. Right. The UWI here agreed to be the kind of the agency to handle the money, the funding, okay. and therefore it was very easy. And Barbados welcomed it. Mm -hmm. So we, I was here running around the Caribbean, getting the, act, the dramatists, the Caribbean activists, drama theater people to relate to each other. We had a meeting, a big meeting, about 40, 50 of us, uh, in Conjuncton College, we mm -hmm. had one in St. Lucia. We had a workshop, a playwrights workshop in St. Croix. And in that time, that energy, all the Caribbean dramatists knew each other. And there was a lot of exchange so going what, on at that time. What, what was the vision? It, it sounds to me, it sounds to me like interconnectivity was one of the things that yes. you were... It was merely a follow-up of my Caribbeanness, Right. if you know what I mean. Okay. Again, it's a right time, right place, right person. Right. Got you, got you. And remember the, all of that, there was the, the dem too and all of we going around. And remember too, that sometime in the 70s, early 70s, I moved around the Caribbean as the liaison officer for the then formulating Caribbean Broadcasting Union, you know, the CBU. CBU, Which yes. is, uh, your um, headquarters is here. Yes. In, um, and I moved around with six or seven Caribbean broadcasters all over the Caribbean making 30 half-hour radio documentaries. So all that, I began to know the Caribbean. Caribbean people began to know about me on radio, mm -hmm. theater, that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. So there were more connections were happening. More and more of Caribbean man. You know, Understood. there is a line from um, Johnny Agard's poem called, I'm a full-blooded West Indian stereotype. You see my straw hat, watch it good. <laughs> and my hard shoe, eh? And the gold chain, and the hot shirt, as a full-blooded West Indian stereotype. <laughs> can you, can I, because we're, memory is not linear, so we're kind of jumping back yeah. and forth. Can you, can you take me through the evolution from he one to them two to all the way? Like, yeah. How, how did that happen? Uh, he won, when I did that one show. Yes, yes, resort. well, you told us. But a few months later, a friend of mine, Mark Matthews, another guy in his, he had a, an accident and nearly broke his neck. Wow. He was kind of recovering in the country, and his wife came to me and says, Ken, Mark, oh, doing not too well, you know, they're despondent, etc." So I went up to Mark and said, Mark, let me do a little thing. You just have to do this, 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 sit down and do it. And we got involved that way. Within a few months, them two was a sensation. Within a year, we would travel all over the Caribbean. And for some reason, we were a sensation. Mm. Nobody had heard this. We would performed everywhere. And as it went on the next year, another one joined. Henry Mutu was, uh, we had seen him as an actor, junior actor in the Theatre Guild of Guyana and Theatre. Oh, Henry. He brought the East Indian -ness. He was East Indian and Portuguese mixed. Okay. And he was very East Indian in attitude and language. And he brought an East Indian-ness that we didn't have before a real... And then 
the poet John Yeagard, who just got a gold award from the Queen um, for the poetry, he joined us and he was like an Anansi, mm-hmm. a red skinned fella. So you had a red skinned fella, and you, know, you had East Indian Portuguese, you had black looking Mark Martins, looked something like you. And, um, and you had this kind of funny brown skin kind of thing. <laughs> we were the whole Caribbean on stage. We didn't think of it at that time. Mm-hmm. It's only kind of recently. Hey, boy, look, you look at it. Can look at it and see it? That may have been part of the power. Yes. Unconsciously. Yeah, yeah. On that stage with the Caribbean, which is an interesting thought there. Yeah. And, yeah, and we moved around all over the Caribbean in various ways. Two, three, two of us, four of us, three of us with musicians. We performed several times in Barbados, mm-hmm. several times in Trinidad. In fact, I think I was brought over, Mark and I was brought over to them too, in the very first crop over. Really? As a part of the... Wow. Yeah, and I think Daphne Hackett, the great Daphne Hackett, who now gets a stamp 40, 50 years later, Daphne Hackett <laughs> was brought us over. Oh, that was and her Frank vision. Frank De Silva, mm-hmm. of Cavaliers, sponsored us. First time we came to Barbados, Mark wow. Matthews and I. Okay. Interesting little history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, clearly there's this, this idea of, of the Caribbean that, that informs you, whether consciously or unconsciously. And like many of us, I mean, this still obtains today, like many of us who get in, involved in, in the performance arts in the Caribbean, broadcasting and media seems to be a through line in your story as well. Um, I, for, for one, remember you very clearly, your involved, well, not all of it, but I do remember your involvement in, in broadcast media. I'd mentioned to the audience watching Caribbean Eye yeah. and um, Banyan pro- Productions, could, could you tell us a little bit yeah. about, about that experience? Because I was moving like? around a lot, and one of the people who helped to form that trade information exchange and idea of moving around was a man named Christopher Laird in Trinidad. He right. belonged to a group, Banyan, which now has an archive of 2,000 digitalized video programs mm. of the Caribbean, the, best in, the only and the best in the world. He came to me. We did a lot of... I went over and did some shows for him for, for, the, for his television program, which he was forming, called Gael. Yes, and uh, Gael. Gael, the only TV station in the Caribbean that plays only Caribbean stuff. Yes. He and various others came about and said, hey, they're getting some funding from UNESCO to do television programs, 13 half-hour television programs throughout the Caribbean, doing Caribbean cultural arts and things. And their, theory, their, their principle was this. They wouldn't go to an island and talk about this, the island doing this, doing that. What they did is took a subject. Let's say steel band, mm. steel band. They would go to several islands that are doing steel band. In other words, they were illustrating the Caribbeanness, the connection, rather than having uh, talk about this island only and that island. We pick a theme, drama, mm. theater, festivals, and do them all over the Caribbean. Find a, a, fest, a fest, festival here in Saint Lucia a different one over there. So th- every program had a common theme, but it showed the Caribbean. The Caribbean. So again, there was a continuity of the Caribbeanness. So l- let me ask you this again, because it's, it's very interesting to me. Um, this would have affected me, because it, I do remember recognizing how similar and how different we were, because you know, it, it brought home a lot of different Caribbean islands that into, was the intention, into your living yeah. room. How, this was a, a conscious thing? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Ah, okay. Absolutely conscious production techn- uh, principle. Okay. So, Ken, with, with your deep immersion in Caribbean-ness and Caribbean culture, you, you ended up doing a lot of work with the Theatre Information Exchange and Caribbean Eye and so on. So then, tell me a little bit about going to America. Imagine that going to that, America. Yeah. that must have been a hell of a culture shock for um, you. Yes, it was. Let's face it, 10 o'clock one Sunday one morning, I'm in Barbados at 10 inches of sand and 84 degrees. And 10 o'clock that same night, 
I land in America, JFK, with 10 inches of snow. <laughs> 10 inches of snow. <laughs> what? I never got accustomed to the cold. I never got accustomed to speed in cars, 70 miles an hour with four lanes and change lanes. If I was in the wrong lane, I'd drive for 20 miles for the next turn off. <laughs> I ain't changing lane. I got too old to be able to adjust to those, those things, yes. There were several other things. Of course, it happened as you go along. Mm. Um, I can get accustomed to a lot of American things, but I, then at the same time, I did. You have to. Yes, yeah. Some were good. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It opened up, America opened up a lot of a diaspora audience for me. Right. So Wherever Guyanese are, they're like pot salt, as we say. They're everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. You go to LA, you get a, uh, you go to uh, Austin, uh, Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver, DC, wherever you go, there's a big Guyanese audience. So you get you know, to. So who live in back home, boy? <laughs> so in a sense you get population 416 <laughs> no no <laughs> so you get to connect to another Caribbean audience yeah but tell me tell me about the first time oh yeah yeah that you went the to first the time I went to America you see you have to remember it was, I came here in 1970, oh, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. The thing about going walk in the Caribbean, let me get up and I just got to explain. This ain't easy to walk in. The great thing about traveling in the Caribbean is readers travel heavy. <laughs> heavy. Particularly when we're going back. We're carrying all them things that you can't get back home. Heavy. Even coming here. If I was coming here in the winter for three months, research on community theater. So they bring, the friends cut, bring all kind of big, heavy, full, big sweaters, three big jackets, three boots. I got 60, for two, two suitcases, 60 pounds each. I travel heavy. Even uh, people ask you to carry presents, because of them days. I was just getting in a taxi to go to the airport in Guyana to come up here for that same thing. A little old lady run outside from next door. She says, can, 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 Mr. Crosby, sir? I know you're going to America. Look, I ain't seen my little boy, my little son for 35 years. He live in New York. Look, carry a little piece of cake for you, a little present. He, she believes, like Bridgetown, you stand up for be, and everybody you're going to see on a Saturday morning. She said, I said, a present, you know. She said, a little five-pound cake. I said, Okay. I didn't know five pound cake is five pound of sugar, five pound of flour, <laughs> five pound of raisin, five pound of egg, five pound. It's 25 pound of sugar. I got in my lap, 25 pound. She said, try not to mash the red icing flowers on the top. <laughs> Next time I was coming up. So I land, uh, that was an, another time. Another time, the first time I think it was, so arriving to this three months thing. So I got two big 60 pound bar. Well, I'm a full blooded West Indian stereotype. You understand? A red cap come to take my bag. Well, as a full blooded West Indian stereotype, I ain't letting this fella know that I can't pick up my two bag. But I know too, I come from Guyana. I know if, if a red cap pick up your bag, you might not see it again. <laughs> so I grabbed the two bag. I just, hmm. <laughs> Uh, under stress and strain, but a plain cool, I'm trying to look calm and cool, full body best thin stereotype. When I take off, I see an exit sign, right? I say if I could mull up some speed, get some momentum, I can jam this door and get through. So take off, boy. The only thing giving me away is my neck strings. Uh. When I reach six inches of the door, the automatic goes, ah! It's true, the door is gone. I never see an automatic door in my life. I hear a chuckle. When I look back, a big, tall, white man like Rambo. You know what he's thinking? He's saying to himself, that's the fifth Arab just fall through his door. I do so. I get up. shit. The damn Americans and the chewing gum. <laughs> so I'll tell the story further. 
They take me to a big hotel in Manhattan. I never see a hotel so big, boy. I accustom Mariana, the largest hotel, they got three stories. If you want to see the top story, you do so. <laughs> yeah, I do a bath and a fall backwards, blaps. And I'll go in. The man check me and he says, excuse me, sir, a red cap will bring, uh, will bring up your, not what's the red cap, but it's bellboy, going to bring your stuff. I said, no, full blood of West Indian stereotype. I grab, and I go in again. She say, you say your room is 913. I only know about 24 rooms. Me know. I say, how the hell I can find 913 rooms? So I take off, boy. And I take off. And I walk in, I see 102, 103. I say, 800 more rooms. <laughs> I put up some steps. I see 217, 218, 217. I see a step. I see 311, 300. And I see a thing do so. A door open. I see elevator. I see elevator, buddy. I just read and see that in Hollywood film. The elevator. I does not get in the elevator. The elevator is pop. I step out again. I'm in room floor one again. <laughs> okay, I can make a long story longer. <laughs> Next morning, I go downstairs for breakfast. I see a room three times the size this. Everybody picking up their own food. You're not accustomed to that? You're just going to say, lady, I want a piece of your cake. The big slice over certain, you know. And you know, you pay right there. I'm making an ass of myself again in front. So I say, hey, I ain't here with that. I want to make food. So I walk around. Just, then there's a big, a big thing mark, coffee, tea, cocoa, milk, and thing, buttons and thing, bending button and thing. I drop quarter, a cup does a boop, and I pick it up. I just <laughs> some brown stuff. I see, shit. I see some white stuff. <laughs> Water, blap. I got an inch of sludge at the bottom of my coffee cup. I hear a chuckle. When I look back, Rambo. I do so. Talk loud, no, no, maybe. Just how I like it. <laughs> Good to see you. All right. Transition, this is called. All you don't have to help me, because I'm in real trouble. Tomorrow is my wife's 60th birthday. I shouldn't have mentioned the number, right? No, the fifth is, sorry, fifth. Did I say fifth? <laughs> I had no pressure. I forget completely about it. It's only tonight, I remember. So all you're going to have to help me. I'm going to sing the first line so I'll get key. Because I know the worst song in the world ever sung is Happy Birthday. You know that. I'm going to sing the key. It might be a Dover key, a car key, you know. I'm going to get the key. And I like it to sing Happy Birthday to my wife, Elizabeth. I know she's feeling bad, boy. She said that she wanted to disappear. All right, here it goes. I don't know how happy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Elizabeth. Happy birthday to you. That is one of the only times in my life I'm taller than she. You see, I walk down the steps. When I walk in around with Beth in America, I walk in tall. I bounce in on my foot, sir. <laughs> you know, catching up with the height. And I walk in young. And I'm wearing a young T-shirt and a cap pulled wrong, so. <laughs> At the time, Beth and I went to some fair in Long Island, New York. And I going in with Beth, and I walk in young and tall, and T-shirt got Marley, and, and I walk in, walk in, in the gate. Pulling out my wallet to pay. The man said, he hand me a piece of paper, wave me on. I said, what's this? He said, senior citizens get a free tapioca pudding <laughs> and a tea, a cup of tea. Tapioca pudding, what the fuck? <laughs> Tom, how the hell he you know as a senior citizen, damn it? I mean, that is get your vex. But in America, it's a very efficient thing. By the time you hit 50, you get an ARP. The other day I get a phone call. You get a lot of phone calls soliciting things. 
I got a phone call, a man offering me, buy one grave, a hole in the grave, what do you call it? A plot, and you get another one free. <laughs> Bet vex like that. I get all kinds of things, you know, thing, they go upstairs and thing, thing. I get that, you know, they, ask, they say build a ramp. Here's the thing, though, there's, there's a cruel part. We were looking for a house to buy in, Long, in, in North Carolina where we, work, we live now. And they had, in the end, we boiled it down to two. One had a ramp, and one hadn't got a ramp. And I say, but that, I like the one without the ramp. It's got a nice view. I went to Toronto to do a show the next day. That morning in Toronto, I was staying at Chris Reed house. The same guy here, Chris Reed, Bayesian, Trinidadian, whatever he is. And she phoned to say, can buy, we buy the house with the ramp? Well, this, my wife buy a house at a ramp. Why was she thinking that? She was like them people trying to sell me a, a plot. She was, oh boy, time will come. So you see, actually, that's a, one of the things. Who, what was the question, how I adopt a Guyana? <laughs> Beth is a very um, streetwise in New York. She lived there for several, several years at university there. She would be driving a car from Long Island into Brooklyn, into Queens, the thing. It's a road to stop the difference. Time you cross the road into Queens, here, bed, lock the door. She said, I said, what's that building? She said, don't point. I said, why? She said, people can think you're giving them the finger, they come out and shoot you. <laughs> you think it's fun? It's good to live. All these things about adopting or not adopting, you understand? Worst part of it, worst part of it. When we first went, we had one car. We used to drop it to the university. I'd come back, go for her in the afternoon. She gets off at 5. I would go at 4 to the gym. The university had a gym, and I would ding, 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 ding. And then I'd come and pick she up. <laughs> well, you know, men, men is exercise noisy. Men are like, <laughs> <laughs> Women don't make the sound when they're exercising in the gym. Women is walking the gym, get on a um, bicycle thing. Two minutes later, they get on my way. They weigh about five times a half hour. <laughs> men pumping iron. And men looking at size as they're they pumping up the money. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> the guy that's for men, men just pump the iron and get big ones. After weight lifting, exercising in a gym, men don't pee. They cannot find it because all the blood. All his biceps? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Where am I going with this? So let me jump. <laughs> that was a, I came here as a cultural event with an award. <laughs> Is there a thing to say? Cancel the award, chief. <laughs> <laughs> no, anyhow, there I was. Beth walks in the one that I, I was thinking, <clears throat> Beth come in early 4 o'clock. Walk straight up to me, she said. The smallest gym, my body could hear. Hey, Jam. Hey, Beth. Ken, darling, don't overdo it. <laughs> two months later, a fellow who I befriended. Yeah. He said, Ken, when you first came two months ago, you came with a tall white woman. Is she a nurse? <laughs> and all you want to know how I adjusted to America? That's the question. And yeah. Anyway, let me, I, there's a time factor here, folks, a time factor here, see? So I've got to do, um, let me do a couple of short little things, you see? We do some of that. Um, let me give another one. I could give you some Caribbean poetry, but I'll tell you my favorite story. My favorite story I like to tell, I must tell it, since it's my opportunity. Adehe. Teenage parties, I want to go right back to the Tate's yard, because my origins, Claremont, all you, where did they, where did they? Yeah, right, arena, all of you. The origin. Teenage party in the delivery room, the same place you have symphony orchestra and thing. Every now and then you have a teenage party. Yeah. Now, teenage party is special. There's always an old aunt standing by the light switch, the last light switch. Because she knows the darkness and teenage hormones don't mix too good. Whereas men dance like this, when the, time, the, the, the light goes out, the, Right away, 
You know that right away, Stephen. Now the TNS part, you got to recognize this. About it. In them days, we used to dance romantically. Romantically. Let's see. Only you. Note the footwork. Can I, my dreams come true? Only you. Yeah? Romantically. Note the footwork. The footworks are important. Because in them days, the same thing as Sambo and thing them South Americans used to be good soccer players because they used the footworks, right? And they, you know, you know, like work um, works like a take. You take the A train. You're supposed to applause for that. Yes, we used to dance romantically. Now, God, it is. We also watch in black and white American films, right? And we used to watch all them kind of film and thing. And one of the things about the films is that we saw barn dance. We see jeans and plaid shirts. So we would put by plaid shirt, put jeans, put straw in somebody's living room, barn. Because in Guyana, you as a vet might notice Marco. Mark, my son-in-law, but no. In Guyana, if you go into a barn, a rail barn, you have to hear, you know what? <laughs> That's why we was known as the third world. <laughs> Anyhow, what do you want, Mark, that does? <laughs> you got it, you got it? You got it? You got it? Third, third world, yeah. <laughs> they thought being a guy, you can't pronounce T-8, the third, you know? <laughs> So there it was. I mean, it was great. Now, let me, I'm going to end it. Wait, wait, wait. To show the hormones, teenage. We used to walk to school, going to St. Stanislaus College, the college high school I went to. You wore short pants and only wear long pants when you got into sixth form. So you could be 15, going on to 16, and then you walk around with your short khaki pants. Well, we don't mind, because if we, we walk in and we bounce in suit to, to let them Convent girls and high school girls see the calf muscles, right? We bounce in. We bounce into work, but go to school, right? <laughs> now, here's a hitch. Here's a hitch. That's all right. But if Rosita Govaya ride past on her bicycle going to school, Rosita Govaya, now the Ursuline Convent, the rule was the dress, the dress got to be just below the calf. Well, you know this, yeah, seriously? Just below the calf. But as Rosita Gavaya was riding her bicycle away from you, and the wind catch Rosita dress, and it roll up, and you see the back of Rosita knee. You're 15 years old, boy. Jesus. <laughs> Bokta can't help you. <laughs> Let me explain to you. Let me explain to you. We had, <laughs> we had um, a geography book called World Geography by Dudley Stamp. It's a green book about this stick. Anybody know it? Yeah. Oh, this is Dudley Stamp book. Them fellas always walk with Dudley Stamp book because when the see was eaten, anybody is going to school from then on. This shit. Okay, I, I think I'm being told to end it. I, I think I'm being told the time is up for this. I've got to get on with the show. I'm going to do just two poems, one of them. Um, hold on, let me see. Oh, this one, to show my Caribbean-ness and my connection here, Barbados. I'm going to try to do one about Barbados and hope we get through it. But I'm going to do one before, you know, people think as a storyteller, you only do a Nancy stories. But I can do a Nancy story, right? Tiger batting, a Nancy bowling, and it's cricket, lovely cricket. Cricket, lovely cricket. Tiger prodding, a Nancy weaving, and it's cricket, lovely cricket. Hit it, hit it. Parrot shouting to Tiger, knocky for four. Tiger gave a roar. 
I can show Nancy who's far as boss. Lay bowl one full toss. See if the ball no loss. <laughs> for a small bowl. The crowd shouted, no! Tiger prodding and Nancy running. And it's cricket, lovely cricket. Cricket, lovely cricket. Second ball bowl and there's a wide. Third ball bowl is the next. Tiger gave another roar, but he had to score. He said, better Nancy, knock on Nancy for four. And Nancy said, I know, I know, looking thin. Wait and see. I could bowl leg break, off break, and a googly. Meanwhile, the monkey behind the stone, yeah, key, 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 turkey watching, keen, 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 because you know Nancy don't play clean. But a Nancy nimbly, spindly, hand spinning at the rate, passing the ball from hand to hand to hand. And you know, spider have eight. <laughs> if you see a Nancy, how we weave it, like it's where we weave it. And the ball ain't leaving a Nancy hand at all, at all, at all. Oh, 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 by the way, Tiger's still waiting. <laughs> What's that? Oh, who is the poet? You see? I can't do this without the wife. Who is the poet? I tend to forget to give credit. Johnny Agard, Guyanese, who was on the All of East show. He just received a gold award from the Queen for his poetry. There's a picture of Johnny and the Queen laughing. The story is this. There was a medal she was giving him, a gold medal. And on one side had a kind of nubile woman doing some throwing of javelin, whatever it is, you know, to, to, to denote purity and grace and thing. And the, that side coming up to him as she had it. And he said, Your Majesty, is that the picture of you? <laughs> that is the story we heard. The two of them were laughing themselves at that. Only he could have done that, and Nancy Mann could have done that. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ken Cosby. <laughs> Ken, congratulations on this wonderful award, the Earl Warner Trust Lifetime Achievement Award. It's been a long journey for you. Um, many, many more awards should have been coming your way, but this one is a wonderful one because it's, it's in the name of a guy that we both knew, that you knew particularly, and, and probably assisted a whole lot when he was a young uh, theater, theater director. And I want to thank the Orwana Trust for bestowing this award on you. I mean, nobody that I know from around the region uh, had done more to advance regional unity in the, in the theater in the Caribbean um, than you have done. Uh, with the Dehiwa and them to all the way, and all the other work you've done, traveling, uh, working with Chris and uh, Laird in Trinidad, and, and, and you know the performances that we did when I was a young man. I want to thank um, you for all of that work. Thank you uh, for all the assistance you gave me personally, and thank you, uh, all Warner Trust, um, for bestowing this award on my friend and buddy, Ken. Ken, take a wine tonight, partner, and drink, eh? Have fun. Well, I'm really sorry I'm not in Barbados, but I would like to um, give Ken my very best wishes and my very best congratulations. I have known him for over 50 years, and I have seen his work in theater. I have seen his work in radio. I've seen his work at Thai Information at the Theater Gill in Guyana. I first saw Ken playing basketball, and I saw him as a hurdler. He then became the secretary of the Basketball Association. We were friends in England when he was at the Rose Buford School of Drama. We played basketball together. I ran a team called Guyana Celtics. The last night I spent in England in 1967 was in Ken's house. And then we worked together in GBS in Guyana, a new registration for four years. Uh, we did an actual play when Ken was at the Theatre Guild. Uh, that was directed by Clement Tate called Hello Out There, my only um, appearance on the stage. Ken went to Barbados and worked with the Theatre Gill, with Ty, and uh, he helped me a great deal when I was at the OECS, and I spent many, many happy weekends, many happy days with Ken in his residence in, in Hastings, and he remains a, a dear friend of mine, and I'm very proud to have been associated with Ken and uh, want to say a uh, very um, big
big congratulations to him and I hope he has a, a very great night. Get ready! 